I'm Flying Jack on Mode 7, Episode 3. The Japanese Super Famicom launched with two games, which we've already looked at, F-Zero and Super Mario World. The nine-month delay between the Japan and US launches, however, meant that Americans could pick from five games on day one. The third of these, Pilot Wings, originally shipped a full month after the console's Japanese debut, which perhaps may seem a little strange given that it honestly feels less complete as a game than its fellow US launch counterparts. Pilot Wings does make a great opposite to F-Zero, though where that earlier game had applied Super NES's Mode 7 tech to give players a blistering arcade racing experience, Pilot Wings takes a different tack. It attempts to best the personal computer platform at the methodical, precise flight simulation genre. Flight sims and Nintendo consoles were by no means strange bedfellows at this point. The NES had played host to quite a few by 1991. However, here's the thing. They were all pretty terrible. The limited capabilities of the NES simply couldn't offer a satisfactory flight experience. Konami's Top Gun and its sequel were okay, but every other attempt, including a dire unlicensed port of Sega's Afterburner, should have stayed grounded. So to this point, proper flight simulators had really only been a PC-exclusive format. Even before discrete graphics cards and 3D accelerators, computers simply had greater horsepower than consoles, better resolution, and perhaps more importantly, a much wider array of control options. With Pilot Wings, Nintendo made an earnest attempt to wrest control of the genre from DOS. While the Super NES couldn't match the resolution of even a basic VGA computer, it did have that whole Mode 7 thing going for it. So what you end up with is a sort of strange hybrid of a game. Pilot Wings doesn't really work like a true and proper flight game like Microsoft Flight Simulator. The control system is, by necessity, much simpler. Rather than offering a suite of flight commands, Pilot Wings largely operates around a control scheme that would work on NES, focusing on the D-pad and the A and B buttons. Granted, some other inputs do come into play, but rarely. For example, you can use the shoulder triggers to toggle your point of view in certain flight modes. The triggers would have been excellent for banking or turning, but keep in mind this was an absolute first-generation Super NES game and, as such, existed before anyone really had a clear idea of what they should actually do with the shoulder buttons. Nintendo was definitely thinking ahead when they added those top mountain buttons onto the controller, but it would take a while for software to catch up. Pilot Wings, unfortunately, wouldn't be the game to stick that innovation. More crucially though, Pilot Wings lacked the scale of proper PC flight sims. The hardware's Mode 7 effect could freely stretch and spin and skew a static bitmap graphic, but so far as I can tell, there was an upward limit on the actual available resolution of those bitmaps. The exact nature of that limit is something I haven't been able to track down in any technical documents on the Super NES, but I can't recall ever having seen any Mode 7 backgrounds that, when scaled out to true pixel resolution, would span more than a few screens at standard res. The console only had so much video RAM after all. At the risk of getting in over my head on technical matters, this apparent limit on Mode 7 background sizes would seem to have had a direct impact on pilot wings, necessarily limiting the available territory that players could cover. Where a PC flight sim would allow players to go soaring from one side of the country to another, pilot wing settings consist of modest, self-contained islands or outposts surrounded by blank expanses of desert or snow. In other words, the hardware itself seemingly limited the nature of pilot wings design. Each stage takes place over a Mode 7 map whose pixel resolution measures 4x5 standard screens of Super NES resolution, turning the game into a series of self-contained challenges, each within a single area. This isn't necessarily bad, but it does mean Pilot Wings feels, well, small. There's no free flight mode here, no opportunity to go soaring across vast tracts of land for open combat or exploration. Instead, you advance through a set of eight different challenges, each more cruel than the last. Eight may not seem like a lot of content, and indeed, Pilot Wings doesn't really have much in the way of substance when you really get down to it. But by no means is this a game you can just blast through in a couple of hours. What Pilot Wings lacks in scope, it more than makes up for with an unrelenting demand for precision and performance. At the same time, it compensates for its lack of sheer size with variety. 
Unlike a traditional flight sim, Pilot Wings doesn't simply stick you behind the yoke of an airplane, or even a variety of different airplanes. There's only one kind of plane here, a light biplane, but it represents only a fifth of the game's challenges. Pilot Wings allows, or rather requires, players to dabble in four additional flight formats besides the plane. Skydiving, hang gliding, a rocket belt, and ultimately a helicopter. This variety acts as Pilot Wings' greatest strength, and it's just so darn Nintendo, and so quintessentially Super NES. The hardware's unconventional design, it would turn out, offered lots of great perks and features in exchange for some suffocating technical limitations, and the best Super NES games played up the strengths to counterbalance the shortcomings. Pilot Wings doesn't quite achieve best of class status, but it certainly demonstrates the compensatory formula that the true greats would employ. Since the hardware seemingly couldn't allow a proper cross-country mode 7 experience, or even the ability to maneuver through three-dimensional structures, the Pilot Wings team attempted to add a large number of different flight formats. Each vehicle, or in this case of skydiving, lack of vehicle, involves its own specific controls, physics, and goals. The light plane is your typical flight simulation, largely centered around throttle, nose pitch, and the angle of your wings relative to the ground. Skydiving, on the other hand, is about controlling your speed and direction without any actual control surfaces to rely on. Hang gliding falls somewhere in between the two, giving you a plane-like experience while your altitude is in a perpetual state of decay. And then there's the rocket belt, which grants players absolute control over their movements, with two intensities for thrusters that allow you to rise, descend, and jet forward at will. The only real limitation of the rocket belt comes from its limited fuel reserve, which in the later challenges puts a hard limit on your flight time and demands efficient maneuvering. Let's talk about those challenges. As I mentioned, Pilot Wings consists of a mere eight stages, but each stage contains multiple challenges. This is where the game gets kind of nasty. In order to complete a stage and move along to the next, you need to complete all of its challenges with a high enough score to reach a performance target. And it's not enough to simply complete the challenges, you have to complete them all in a single go. You can completely ace two of the three challenge stages, but screw up on the last portion of the test and you'll have to start all three tasks from the beginning. Your scoring goals start out pretty high, and they only become more demanding as you advance. So by the end of the game you need to perform in three different areas of flight, with almost zero room for error. What makes these challenges so difficult, at least for me, comes from the way they require you to switch mental gears. If you simply needed to complete, say, three biplane challenges in a row in order to advance to a new stage, pilot wings probably wouldn't be so tough. But when you're alternating between biplane, hang glider, skydiving, and rocket belt, you're constantly summoning up different skill sets and trying to perform each to the best of your ability. This is no simple matter, and the zero tolerance scoring system requires players to command absolute mastery of all the game's various formats. Each vehicle you command has not only its own mechanics, but also its distinct objectives. For example, you need to land biplanes on a runway, which isn't so tough, but hang gliders, over which you have much less control, require you to put them down on tiny, specific target points. On the plus side, you'll become pretty amazing at every area of pilot wings by the time you complete Challenge 8. On the other hand, it can be so frustrating at times that you may not find it worth the effort to get that far. It doesn't help matters that Pilot Wings is arguably trying to do a little too much with what it has to work with. As with the map design, which focuses on self-contained areas rather than sprawling with open environments, the digital-only controls lack a certain delicacy. This would be rectified in later Pilot Wings games, beginning with Pilot Wings 64 five years later, but on Super NES you're stuck working with a simple D-pad that doesn't quite have the versatility of an analog controller. As such, Pilot Wings is by far the most grueling and demoralizing game in the entire series, and it's not entirely the player's fault. It is worth the pain though, because at the end of each half of the game's challenges you're rewarded with a special stage in which you control a helicopter. The chopper controls work somewhere between those of a plane and a jetpack, combining the heft of a full vehicle with the freedom to act independently of, or counter to, inertia. The real difference to the chopper sequences is that they give you a set of distinct objectives and, oh yes, offensive capabilities. The secret missions require you to rescue hostages while taking out a number of anti-aircraft batteries. It's basically top-down choplifter, and it would be totally satisfying if, like the rest of the game, it weren't so insanely difficult. Your poor chopper can only take a single hit before going down, and the limited window of visibility on the AA emplacements dotting the map makes it entirely possible for your ship to be taken out of commission by a gun you couldn't even see. You can destroy the emplacements, but they're thick and aggressive around the landing zone, and you have no radar to indicate where to find them. So it's ultimately down to memorization and repetition. And boy, does it get repetitive. 
Bizarrely, the game contains only two of these chopper missions. The other stages in Pilot Wings feel in many respects like a tutorial building up to the helicopter sequences, which is why it's so bizarre that only two of the game's ten total stages involve chopper-based search and rescue. It's almost as though you're given a massive tutorial and then sent home just as the proper game begins. So Pilot Wings allow you to play around with a buffet of aerial vehicles leading up to recruitment as a rescue pilot. But in every area, its controls feel limited, its strict requirements can be terribly punishing, and its physical play spaces often come off as restrictive and cramped. And that's not even getting into the limitations of Mode 7, which, awesome as it seemed in 1991, ultimately amounts to the console tilting a flat graphic round and pretending it's a three-dimensional space while lacking any option for projections that break the surface of the map. The illusion works from a distance, but it falls apart when you move in close to the ground, especially in the rocket belt and skydiving sequences in which your tiny little avatar ultimately skims his way over giant, chunky blocks of ground detail. I'm afraid Pilot Wings doesn't really hold up 25 years after its debut, but perhaps that's to be expected of a game whose ultimate purpose was to showcase an innovative piece of technology that has long since been rendered obsolete. To Nintendo's credit, they managed to crank out a heck of a tech demo here. No other home console at the time could have pulled this off, not even the mighty Neo Geo. Still, it ultimately comes off as somewhat half-finished, especially once you reach the final chopper stage only to have the whole thing come to an abrupt end. It was a dazzling showcase for a remarkable hardware feature, but it lacks a certain something that could have elevated it to the same classic status as F-Zero and Super Mario World. Fortunately, its sequels would offer a more playable demonstration of their respective systems, and in fairness, the Nintendo 64 and 3DS were better suited for proper 3D aerial navigation. Considering what the devs had to work with here, Pilot Wings is an excellent example of developers pushing the boundaries of available hardware to create an experience that should have been wholly inconceivable at that level of technology. There are certainly worse legacies. Next on Mode 7, it's Bowser vs. Uh, Will Wright. 